It's quiet. We can see the southern face of the mountain very clearly. It's larger than it ever is in any other capacity. You're staring right across at it. And that for most people is the emotional part of it to be able to be part of the Himalaya now. You are gliding just like the birds do up there. You're part of the Himalaya. You're enveloped in six or seven different mountain peaks in a circle around you. And directly online with you is Mount Everest. Hi, welcome to Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. Today, we are journeying to Mount Everest. And not only are we taking you to Mount Everest, we're taking you skydiving on Mount Everest. I interviewed a um, friend in, uh, in the skydiving industry, Tom Noonan, who has been skydiving ever since 2008. Tom has over 3,500 skydives, and he also, along with Wendy Smith, hold the world record for the highest parachute landing at 17,192 feet. And Tom is an amazing man. He's so smart. Uh, He can really tell you how it all works. And if you have any questions around like technical questions of how it all works, Tom is your man. Uh, He's also a tandem instructor. And if you want to skydive Everest, Tom can make that dream come true. Um, He gives his information in the episode. Definitely keep on listening to find out more on how you can make this incredible incredible experience happen. What we're talking about today is skydiving Everest, which if I had to think of the most extreme thing that you could do, I feel like skydiving Everest is probably it, uh, unless you've got another idea for um, no, I think, well, Everest Skydive, I think, is one of the most extraordinarily unique events that we've ever created in skydiving. Um, it just takes so many different aspects of our sport and what we do, and it um, it combines it all into one opportunity. Skydiving in a remote location, skydiving in a very scenic, uh, beautiful location. I mean, for the majority of skydivers, the jump itself is always the the driving factor behind it. You know, right. the excitement of exiting an aircraft, whether it's from an aircraft over Lake Wales, an aircraft here to land, um, exiting the plane and going for the skydive is the most exhilarating part of the process. But then to be able to take that and place it into the Nepali Himalaya, where we have the most remote, one of the most remote locations on Earth, turbulent weather systems, um, just the enormous uh, array of mountains around us. It's just a stunning visual and then on top of that, we're also integrating uh, halo systems into the whole process. So civilian halo systems didn't really exist until we started doing this. Halo up until that point had been the uh, domain or the realm of um, of the military. Basically, that, uh-huh. that type of equipment was supportive of specific jobs and specific types of jump profiles that needed to be done. And it was never really considered applicable to civilian use simply because of the complexity of it. Um, the uh, relative inavailability of the components for it. And we put the three of them together in Ever Skydive 10 years ago, and we've been able to continue on ever since then. So cool. So can you explain to our listeners what a halo jump is? Sure. Um, a halo jump is by definition, high altitude, low opening. And to put that in context, it's not dangerously low. Um, there's basically two types of skydives that occur. There are low opening skydives and high opening skydives. And so the opposite of halo would be hey-ho. And I think those are the two acronyms people would be most familiar with. A hey-ho is simply that you go up really high and it could be 18,000 feet, it could be 21,000 feet, it could be 30,000 feet. And you immediately open your parachute. And so it's a high altitude, high opening. And then there's a tremendous amount of navigation that's required to get back to a a landing area. It could be seven, eight miles from exit point to landing, depending upon the altitudes and the the upper winds. The low opening is basically just distinguishing between opening up your parachute immediately out of the aircraft versus um, opening your parachute at a normal altitude for any particular sport or uh, 
purposeful skydive where you've actually taken a free fall of 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 120 seconds. And then you open the parachute at approximately anywhere from 5,000 feet down to 2,000 feet above ground level. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. you've exited the aircraft high and then you have taken a, a long delay of sorts and then you open your parachute as you normally would between 5,000 and 2,000 feet. And then it's a much shorter parachute right at that point. I love it. I love it. So if you go on a trek to Everest to go skydive Everest, what does that look like? How long does it take to get there? And then uh, tell us about actually skydiving next to Mount Everest. So skydiving with Mount Everest, it's a long trip to get there. It's the... Just book some tickets to go out for next month, and it's uh, 21 hours. Some of the cheaper or some of the quicker flights, quicker duration flights, are 21 hours. So from say Orlando to Doha, Doha to Kathmandu, takes about 21 hours to get there. Once you arrive in Kathmandu, it's basically like New York City um, in the, to the extent that it's a very busy, bustling community. Uh, there's buildings, there's people, there's just um, activity everywhere. And from there, we then take a domestic flight the following day into Lukla, which is an airport in the Himalaya. It is 9,000 feet above sea level. It's the... Is that the dangerous airport? Yes, the world's most dangerous airport. That's what I was trying to say. (laughs) Uh, They call it the world's most dangerous airport. It's a 1,200-foot runway, uphill, uh, only one landing direction. You can only land in, uh, whether it's upwind, downwind, crosswind, you are landing in one direction about... uh, 12 degree pitch upward for the first 900 feet of it and then 300 feet of um, flat space to turn off into the ramp and park the plane. And to their credit, the pilots there are extraordinarily talented for the number of flights they make every day. Uh, it's like, I guess it'd be the equivalent of landing on an aircraft carrier without l- landing on an aircraft carrier. You know, when you Ooh. see those types of videos and footage. Now, again, I've never landed on an aircraft carrier, but I can only imagine that's what it looks like to the pilots coming in there. It's a very tight space and there's no go arounds. They have to commit to land. And um, yeah, that brings us to 9,000 feet where the, the entryway to the Himalaya. We then spend two days walking up through the Himalaya, through the, um, the valleys and the ridges and the mountain lines. That so two us- days walking. So how, days walking. how many miles are, are you walking in this trek? Um, it, that depends on how far in you want to go into the Himalaya. If you're going to do the entire Everest Base Camp trek, it's about 80 miles. Whew. Over the course of a two-day, or excuse me, over a two-week period, the first two days, we might walk eight to 12 miles. Okay. Uh, four to five miles the first day, six to seven miles the second day. All right. And we ascend from 9,000 feet up to 11,500 feet on foot. And then from there, we spend two to three days acclimating to um, our new altitude of 11,500 feet. That's our new sea level. We live there for a few days until we acclimatize. And then once we've acclimatized, at that point, we will set out to begin our skydiving operations. And the context of the skydiving operations, we basically bring a drop zone from anywhere in the world up to the mountains. We have to fly in everything. We have to bring in our equipment on yaks. Um, We're actually, admittedly, the first few years, we spent a lot more time using the yaks, getting our gear up. Uh, But in the last few years, we have actually converted over to helicopters. It's just, it's a lot more efficient, believe it or not, to just drop everything in one helicopter lift than have 12 or 14 yaks coming up the side of a mountain because they're incredibly reliable, but sometimes they go yak crazy and they just sort of do their own thing. And so getting them to a point where we can actually depend on the arrival time of the gear, it's a lot harder to say that a yak will arrive at a certain day and time versus a helicopter. We know thanks to GPS um, exactly when it's going to arrive at our location with our gear. Wow. So yeah, imagine um, setting up a drop zone anywhere is a technical application. And I've said this before in interviews that setting up a drop zone in one of the world's most remote locations is incredibly technical. It's incredibly challenging. And that's why there's such a small group of people working in the process and in the, prog- in the process of creating it. And it's not so much as anybody is that good at what they do. Um, I consider myself a very average skydiving instructor, but I'm able I to I wouldn't do- say that. Well, I'm able to do one thing very well, exit from 30,000 feet stable, put Mount Everest behind me and allow for my videographer teams to take phenomenal photos of the customers that we bring up there. So they go home with a picture of themselves and Mount Everest behind them. And that's really the biggest, um, the biggest concern that we have as an industry. You know, for example, a video bust on a tandem jump you might make at Lake Wales, if they have to repeat that jump, it's about $300. 
Right. A video bust up in Nepal is about eight thousand to nine thousand dollars to repeat Ooh. that one specific jump. Wow. Yeah. So wow. a lot, lot of pressure there. So we use a lot of the same people, um, a very small group of, of, of staff that we've been working together for 10 years. We're just really good at being very efficient at this process. Yeah. So how many days does it actually take to get to where uh, you're going to do the jumps? So from the landing in Kathmandu, let's say you land on a Saturday, you spend Sunday in Kathmandu, we spend that day acclimating to the um, excitement of the city, we go on tours to the Monkey Temple, to the Grand Stupa, which is a um, massive uh, statue for Buddha in the middle of um, middle of Kathmandu, it's just a beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful place. And then the next day we fly everyone into Lukla. Once we've landed in Lukla, <laughs> We're at about 9,000 feet. And for most people, being upwards of 5,000 feet above sea level is mildly traumatic to the body, but nothing terrible. I mean, we even have people here in the United States that will go to Leadville, Colorado, which I believe is somewhere around nine or 10,000 feet to go skiing. And they'll be winded, maybe a little bit of altitude sickness. Um, but for the most part, I've never really heard of anybody having issues flying up there and going to go skiing or snowboarding for the day uh -huh. and then returning back down at the end of the day to a lower altitude. The body starts to go through certain precautionary uh, procedures such as heart rate will increase, uh, breath rate will start to increase just to, to generate more oxygen flow into the body. And we'll basically just chill out for a few hours and let that process happen mm -hmm. as opposed to landing and, and hitting the ground running, so to speak. So we spend a few hours just relaxing. And then once that whole process has begun and sort of stabilized, then we start trekking a very nice, easy afternoon trek about two to four hours or so. And then from there, uh, we arrive down at 8,400 feet around dinner time, And it's time for us to uh, check into our tea houses and a tea house is basically a big house that has 20 30 rooms in it a common eating area a common kitchen area and it's owned and run by a family they feed you they give you rooms to stay in and then the following morning you pick back up again on the trail and uh, bill booth actually made a really good observation while you're we up there the himalaya is basically the land that the wheel forgot there wow. is no cars there's no carts there's no um, bringing things up by wagon. It's all just either walked up by person or by animal or flown up by aircraft. And so our second day, we walk from 8,400 feet to 11,500 feet. Wow. And that takes all day. It's about an eight hour day. It's not hugely exhausting because we stop and we rest and then we exert ourselves and stop and rest and exert ourselves. But by the time you get to 11.5, now it's time to really just stop and relax. And um, we spend about a day and a half literally doing nothing. Your job is to rest. Your job is to go find a little coffee shop. There's all these little beautiful um, there's coffee shops. shops. Yes. There's espresso. One of my good friends, Nima Sherpa, he has a uh, coffee shop called cafe 8848. This village is all throughout the mountains and the villages have electricity, hydro powered electricity. They have Wi-Fi now wow. they've got cell signals. So 10 years ago it was intermittent, um, internet and now it's basically you've got better internet up on the himalaya than you do in florida oh um, it's expensive but it's available and so um we stay in this little village called namshi bazaar for two days and we just they have bakeries for pizza and baked goods and we have uh cafe mochas and things like that there's even a couple of bars up there you know so some of the world's highest um bar tabs have been raised at those altitudes <laughs> And, and you're already at a higher altitude and drinking. That can't be a great yes, Well, it's comedy. actually, and I'm not, I, I don't consume a lot of alcohol in my life, but um, up there, I don't consume any simply because one beer has the equivalent of two or three uh, beers at sea level, just because you've got less, um, just, I can't really explain why other than to say that the um, drinking alcohol at high altitudes, just, you get drunk quick and it's easier to get it dehydrates you so you have the potential to become symptomatic with um altitude sickness or just hypoxia uh -huh. so while we don't we certainly don't curtail anyone's nightly activities we do ask them to use a level of caution uh -huh. in their decision to do so got it got yep. it and my friend dawa up there he owns an irish pub so if anybody fancies a guinness or a, a shot of jameson they even have that up on the mountain as well oh wow crazy yeah 
Totally crazy. Yep. So, so, so where do you we go get there. there? Okay, so so where do you set up the airport and where do you set up like your drop zone? So about 700 feet above this little village in the, in the, the sky, I call it Sky City, Namshi Bazaar. You're on the side of a mountain. At the top of the mountain ledge, there's a flat surface, another 1,200 foot dirt runway. And that's actually the Samboche Airport. It's our airfield. It's the, one of the highest airfields in the world at 12,000 350 feet, but it's not used very often. And when it is used, it's mostly helicopters, MI8s, um, Eurocopters, things of that nature, tourism and supply runs for helicopters. And so we haven't had an aircraft in there in probably six or seven years. We used to fly a PC-6 in there, a Pilatus Porter, um, but getting an aircraft like that into that part of the world has proven to be exceptionally difficult. So um, we actually converted our program over to a B3 helicopter instead, which is pretty cool. So now we're jumping out of a helicopter and it's uh, basically we have a lodge that we work out of called the Pinjo Lodge. Uh -huh. they, have a tea, they have a tea room that we rent. We basically take over for a week and we do all of our oxygen fittings, all of our equipment uh, gear ups in that room. And then we put tents on the side of the, the mountain and we pack all of our parachutes on the side of the mountain in between yaks and uh, trekkers walking back and forth. Wow. Wow. Okay. So it is jump day or you, you spend a few days there jumping. And if the weather is good, mm -hmm. then, then people gear up and, and what do they wear for this Everest skydive? So we provide everything. We provide what we call puffer jackets, you know, down jackets. They're handmade by a friend of mine named Rajan in Kathmandu. We take measurements and everyone has their jackets made for them so they stay warm at night. And then we also make them jumpsuits. The jumpsuits are made out of a, um, I don't even know, I, I couldn't tell you the exact material, but it's more like a Kodora uh -huh. than, um, than a cotton type fabric. So it's um, air permeable, but not very much. And then on top of that, we have, or I should say underneath that, they're, uh, they're fleece lined. So we have fleece lined jumpsuits. It's, it's basically a rigid nylon uh, material fabric similar to that of a, a, say, maybe even a parachute, but it's a thick nylon. And early on when we first started doing this in 2008 and 2009, we really didn't know what we didn't know about altitudes in terms of temperatures. So to tell someone that they're exiting an aircraft at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it sounds cold. Uh, I've done that in the North Pole and I've done that in Nepal, and it's actually warmer to do that in the North Pole than it isn't to do it in Nepal. Wow. Uh, just I don't know if it's because of... Uh, the solar um, convections or whatever you want to call it, inver temperature inversions. I don't know what it is, but um, it was really cold the first few years we were up there. But I think a lot of that was because we expected it to be. We thought it would be. But then we started realizing that people's um, adrenaline and their excitement about the whole process, that we didn't need to overload on fabric, if that makes sense. That huh. you, can, you can exit an aircraft into minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit and be completely fine for two to three minutes, uh, four or five minutes, and most people that do this jump, have the only cold they really experience is after the parachute opens. Ah, got Exit it. Exit altitude, you're so engaged in what you're doing that you have no clue how cold you are. But once the parachute opens, then you register that, wow, it is actually kind of cool up here. And from head to toe, we're basically covered. The only area of our bodies that really seem to be subject to the cold are our hands. If you've ever uh -huh. been on a, a high altitude hop and pop, and your fingers are just chilled to the bone, that kind yes. of thing. Yes. That happened to us occasionally eight years ago. And so I've actually just, I've revamped all of the gloves that we bring up there. So that, that is the one area that we pay special attention to is keeping your hands warm. Got it. So we, we've got um, winterized gloves that we jump with. And with warm hands, other than that, there really isn't any, um, any cold or any effect of the cold up at those altitudes. And so we provide everything. We provide helmets, goggles, gloves, jumpsuits. The only thing we don't, actually I shouldn't say everything. The only thing we don't provide are shoes. Okay. So how high is this drop zone? This one is our primary drop zone is 12,350 feet. Incredible. Now how high is Everest and what altitude are you jumping from? So Mount Everest is 29,000 ish, uh, 29,028 feet, I think. I know it's 8,848 meters, but the conversion, I'm not 100% sure on. I want to mm -hmm. say 29,028 feet or so. So we are exiting our helicopters at approximately 23 to 24,000 feet. We basically, we reach the service ceiling of the aircraft and 
for us to take it any higher than that, it's essentially it's compromising the flight envelope of the of the machine itself. So we we fly about five thousand feet below the peak. If you if, the, if my math is right, five or six thousand feet below the yeah. peak. Um, the upside is that with the helicopter, we're able to basically fly the ridges of the mountains. So when we had the aircraft before the Pilatus, we were basically departing the area and then coming back to it. Whereas with the helicopter, we're actually climbing up on and over the mountains, the very mountains that we're going to be jumping over. Incredible. Incredible. So how many people does this helicopter fit? That depends. Uh, For Everest, it, it holds comfortably four people. Okay. So how long does it take for the helicopter to get you up to altitude? 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So 15, 20 minute ride. I mean, I would just love to get into the brains of people into your brain during that time, especially the first time as you're in a helicopter looking at Everest, knowing you're about to jump out. There's something incredibly um, exotic about helicopter skydives in general. And then to take that into the mountains, the um, we're all used to the sound of a piston engine 182 or a turbine engine twin otter. Um, a helicopter makes a very unique high pitched noise and it's uh, it's very surreal to simply lift off of the ground. Once the uh, helicopter has come off the ground and you basically become uh, airborne with it, you're now essentially hovering either in space or hovering and then moving forward. How they fly is just, it's, that by itself is an extraordinary experience. They lower the nose and they take off down the runway. And you know, this is going to sound silly, but it feels like, for me anyway, when the Millennium Falcon jumps to light speed. You know, you're in this cockpit that is entirely open in the front. You can see everything you're doing and your visibility and access to the surroundings, the scenery, are unlike anything an airplane could provide. And then at that point, climbing to altitude, we're then on the ridges. You can see the climbers. You can see the snow, the granite. Um, You're actually very intimately immersed into the mountain because you're just above it the whole way up. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's... almost as inspiring as the jump itself, just to be in the helicopter. That's incredible. Yep. So you, you get to about 25,000 feet. Is that what you said earlier? Uh, between 23 and 24, depending okay. upon density altitudes um, and the service ceiling of the aircrafts. And then it's time to jump out. Now you are taking people tandem skydiving, the, the guests, where they are strapped to a tandem instructor. And what I know about jumping out of a helicopter is that you're, you actually feel your stomach drop from a helicopter because it's stationary uh, versus a plane. If you jump out of a moving plane, you don't really feel the stomach drop. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're, you're jumping out at a high altitude right next to Everest. You've got your guests on in front of you. And, and then what happens next? So we're not actually at a hover at that altitude. And again, I'm not a helicopter pilot, so I, I would not want to claim that I, I know the specifics oh, behind, sure, the, sure. behind the engines and, and, the, and the performance, but they can't just hover at those altitudes. They have to have a forward speed to stay, to provide that lift. Got so it. Our, forwards, our forward speed is like 60 miles an hour. So Oh, wow. So do you feel the stomach drop on this jump? Not at all. No. So it's wow. basically like a almost like exiting a Cessna 182, you know, a low airspeed exit um, that's very smooth to transition into. That's there's incredible. very There's very little throw. There's very little hill that we have to transfer, you know, the horizontal to vertical uh, transfer of relative wind. There's almost none of that. Um, but there's enough relative wind and enough air that it's just a very smooth downward transition, almost like an accelerated balloon jump. That's how I would describe it to people. You know, a balloon is truly a hover right. where you are going from zero airspeed to 120 miles an hour vertical, whereas we're exiting at 60 miles an hour forward speed. And the helicopter is in a slight descent to keep the um, the airspeed up. So we're, we're entering into very firm air. And I've seen a lot of people exit uh, balloons where they're swimming, trying to find that relative wind, trying uh-huh. to find it. And I've been just, there. There's no swim. There's no need to find your um your to find your uh, uh what's what I'm looking for stability. There's no right. there's no struggle. 
exiting a helicopter is actually incredibly easy compared to Twin Otters. King Airs, I think, are the hardest aircraft to exit, and I applaud all of our King Air tandem instructors out there. High yeah. airspeed, small door. We're a big door, low airspeed. We're working within the best context of that uh, type of process. So for tandem instructors, it, as long as you understand how the system works, the helicopter, and how you're getting yourself onto the strut and off of the, the helicopter, it's really not a huge uh, transition issue for any anyone. And we we have sport jumpers and wingsuiters and free flyers. We have all kinds of skydiving has occurred up there successfully. That all it takes from the aircraft perspective is to make sure that we do our due diligence with uh, ground dirt dives on exit procedures, exit techniques. And it's very easy because we use the helicopter as the mock-up. We just turn it off. We own it while we have it, so we're in no rush to turn it back on again. We don't need to force anything unless we're good and ready to go. Got it. So once you jump out, how long is the free fall next to Mount Everest? Well, the air density is thinner, or uh -huh. is lower, I should say. So we actually fall faster. If you were to exit a tandem skydive or even a sport jump, let's say at Lake Wales in Florida, our free fall speed is about 120 miles an hour. Our drogue fall speed in tandem is about 120. At those altitudes, um, it's probably closer to 140 miles an hour. Wow. So call that a 10 to 20% increase in speed, depending mm -hmm. upon the weights of the people, uh, the types of drogues we're using. Um, probably, a, I'd say it's a legitimately a 30 to 40 second free fall. Okay. So 30 to 40 second free fall next to the tallest mountain in the world. That has got to be exhilarating. It is. However, I must say that while the skydive itself is quite exhilarating and um, you know, I'm looking in my office looking at some photos as we're talking just to kind of get my mindset into what we're discussing, the overwhelming adrenaline experience with the jump with Mount Everest it's a catch 22 part of it to get the best photo. We need to turn you away from Mount Everest, you know, turn <laughs> your back to it. So the million dollar photo, you're not actually looking at Mount Everest cause it's behind you. So it's basically, it's a dance that we do up there for lack of a better term. We exit, we get stable, we set our drogue, we turn towards the mountain we let the uh, customers, the guests enjoy the view. And then we turn 180 degrees from it, get the right lighting, the right uh, offset, uh, angles for our videographers to get that photo and then the parachute opens now when the parachute opens that's actually for me and for most of the customers that we work with most of the guests that's the most overwhelming part of the process because we're now directly in line with mount everest it's quiet we can see the southern face of the mountain very clearly it's larger than it ever is in any other capacity. You're staring right across at it. Wow. And that, for most people, is the emotional part of it, to be able to be part of the Himalaya now. You are gliding just like the birds do up there. You're part of the Himalaya. You're enveloped in six or seven different mountain peaks in a circle around you. And directly online with you is Mount Everest. And so to be able to share that experience, that's Everyone that lands that sees Mount Everest under canopy says that for their, um, from their experience, that part of it was the moment they'll never forget. So that's why we bring hand cams with us too. We'd hate hand cam because it's not part <laughs> of, you can't get that beautiful panoramic shot. But once the parachute opens, we can turn you know, the cameras on. And at that point, we ignore that the hand cameras are even there until the parachutes open. And then at that point, uh, we can record the canopy descent for them and they can see the, themselves with Mount Everest beside them and, uh, yeah, it's a stunning experience to see that. So have you ever had someone not want that million dollar shot because they just want to stare at Mount Everest for the entire free fall? Nope. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. And I think a lot of that is because the entirety of the ride to altitude, they're staring at Mount Everest for a good portion of that. They're, we were able to see Mount Everest from the ground as well, where we're working from. So we, we're immersed with Mount Everest from the moment we get to our drop zone area to the moment we leave. So there is quite a bit of um, exposure to the mountain itself before the skydive even actually occurs. And 
the helicopter being probably the most intimate experience with Mount Everest because we get as close to it as we can with the, with the helicopter. And I think the skydive portion of it, I think everyone is overwhelmed. I think even the instructors get a little overwhelmed. I know I'm at my top of my brain's pan function at that point, trying to make sure that I do everything right, you know, in that environment. So I think everybody, the instructors included, are just so amped up on getting the job done correctly that it's not until the parachute opens that everybody can sit back and really appreciate what they've just accomplished and what they've just done. Wow. Wow. Okay. So we're going to talk some logistics here. So in order to do this skydive, how old do you have to be? 18 years old. And what about weight? So our maximum weight limit is 225 pounds. And that in and of itself, when we think about maximum weights and we think about the, um, the size and shape of the people that we work with, it's all contingent on the equipment's ability to have a reasonable expectation of a safe return. Because we all know that skydiving is not safe. Skydiving is dangerous no matter where you do it. At sea level and the mountains, halo jumps, no matter what you're doing, you're always taking a risk. And the right. idea of risk versus reward is one way to look at it, but we prefer to look at it in terms of risk versus risk mitigation. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, what if uh, maybe you've got like limited mobility, uh, but maybe you're in good shape? Is there a way to get up there, maybe like on a yak or something without having to make the physical trek in? Yes, we can do anything up there. Uh, we, have, we have the ability to move people and equipment with helicopters. Uh huh. So if we had someone that let's say, and we have yet to do this, and I hope someday we have the opportunity to be able to bring up someone who is unable to walk to experience this process, we can fly people in to Lukla uh-huh. at 9,000 feet. And rather than leave for the trek, we would basically uh, stay in Lukla for two to three days while they acclimate to that altitude. Because without the physical exertion of the walk, the acclimatization is going to take a little longer. That's part of the reason why we force people on foot to go up there is because their cardiovascular systems are more likely to adapt to the conditions changing if they're using their cardiovascular systems. But we have had numerous people fly into Lukla. It's typically reporters that are only there for a couple of days. They'll fly into Lukla, spend the night in Lukla, and then come up the next day and interview us and watch what we're doing and then fly back down to Lukla that afternoon. So I think for someone we were going to take on the jump itself up to 23,000, 24,000 feet, I would have them stay two nights in Lukla uh-huh. each day coming up to visit us to spend time at 12,000 feet because the rule of thumb is go high, sleep low. Mm-hmm. So either way, we would bring them up to 12,000 feet, spend the day with us, and then bring them back down uh, to sleep at 9,000 feet so that their body has a, a less, um, less chance of developing any hypoxic or altitude sickness uh, symptoms. Okay, now... We're getting to the million dollar question here. Cost. How much does this cost to go and do this experience? And also, what is the cost if you wanted to accompany someone who's doing the skydive, but you weren't going to skydive Everest? So the cost of making a tandem jump, and it's actually a two jump program. They get two skydives, two tandem jumps is $25,000. And the reason why we give them two jumps is that it's a very exhaustive process to get there, get to the point where you make the jump. And then the jump itself, because it's so efficient, is over up and down within an hour. From the time we board the aircraft to the time that they're back down getting de-rigged, an hour has gone by. So if you can imagine spending 11 days with us for a one-hour experience, that is truly one of the most extraordinary uh, experiences on Earth or above Earth. The first question is always, wow, how much is it to do it again? I would love to do that again. And most of our customers, 99% of them, have always wanted to go back up and make a second jump. So about five years ago, we realized that we should probably just, to keep everybody on the same program and make it easier logistically, just plan to take everyone on two skydives. The first one is the initial jump where all of their sensory overload can occur and then Uh land. And now when they go back up the second time, they're more likely to enjoy it because now they've already done it once. They have a second opportunity to experience it, to take it in in a different capacity, And on the second jump, if we get the photos we want for the first one, we can turn them around and show them on Everest the entire time. And ultimately, if that's what they want, we'll do it anyway, even if we don't get them the photos they want. Right. Because the customer is always right. So that's for uh, two tandem jumps. Uh, For sport jumpers, $22,000 for two jumps. 
The first one is a hop and pop from about 6,000 feet. That's just to get acclimated to the halo systems. And then the second jump is a high altitude jump, the 23, 24,000 with a dedicated videographer to uh, get those photos and capture all that for them. And for $25,000, these sport jumpers get one low jump and two high jumps, and they can do whatever they want in their second high jump, a wingsuit jump, a four-way, whatever they want to do. And, you know, when we talk about the cost of something like this, the, one of the reasons it's so expensive is that we're basically moving a drop zone into the Himalaya. And if you can put it into context, like a bottle of water that's a dollar here might be $3 up on the mountain, just because uh -huh. you have to walk it, fly it, and, and, and store it. We have to ensure everything we do. We ha we're, you know, we're operating one of the most expensive helicopters in the world to ensure, because it's the most reliable helicopter in the world, to do what it's doing. And we're bringing in $100,000 worth of gear. We have to ship all that back and forth. We have to get our staff in there paying for airfare, paying for food, paying for their lodging. So when you think about the per jump cost of an individual person jumping out of a helicopter might be in the $4,000 range up there when you put into the context of everything that goes into getting them the equipment, the oxygen systems, the permits, everything else, it goes up to about $8,000 per, per person per jump. It's not just the cost of a single skydive. It's the cost of an 11 day expedition. And ultimately we don't sell a skydive. Uh, so one of the things that I've really been taking a tremendous amount of pride in over the years, and I've always been just so happy to get the feedback when people leave us, they go, that wasn't a skydive. That wasn't an event. You didn't bring us to an event. You brought us to an experience because you're completely immersed in the culture of Nepal, the, the city of Kathmandu, the mountains of the Himalaya, the people, the locals, the food, the accommodations. You go home with 30 or 40 new friends from the mountain that you met. Um, so we don't provide anyone a skydive. We provide everyone a life-changing experience. And that's ultimately the value on that is tenfold of what we charge for the actual event. Yeah. Um, you know, so people leave Nepal a changed person. You know, it's uh -huh. um, kind of like Star Wars with the Force. I like Star Wars references. Yeah. The Force is very strong in Nepal, in the Himalaya. I don't know if it's um, electromagnetic energy source. I don't know if it's um, spiritual for some versus others. But the, the universe makes more sense up there than it does anywhere else in the world. Wow. Now, what if you're joining someone else, but you aren't going to skydive? How much does that cost? Everything included, they get $5,000 for the, um, the trekking accommodation. That's for someone who's going to stay in the same room as them. Um, it's $5,000 for an uh, accompanying trekker to join them on the whole process for the 11 days. Got it. Because not everyone wants to skydive, but someone else yep. may want to be uh, support for the other person. Now, when, when do these jumps happen? They happen in May and November, mostly November. Oh, one last kind of fallback oh. to the other question was that, uh, was that we also have a full-on production team that sends people home with not just that million-dollar photo, but you have an expedition documentary that you were the star of. Wow. And I, I, sent, you the, um, I sent you the link that you can – put up with this after it's published it's impossible e even now on the f on a, a podcast to be able to truly explain the experience that our guests are are privy to we we don't want to send them home with a three-minute skydiving video like they would get at the local drop zone not that there's anything wrong with that that for that purpose and that price that is perfect for our cu for customer bases of tandem jumping but when someone goes home after an 11 day life changing experience, we have to give them a production or we want to, I should say, give them a production that is equal to their experience and their, their memory. So when they go home for the holidays, when they're with their families and they say, I went skydiving over Mount Everest and people go, what? Huh? Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. They show pictures. Oh, well that's interesting. I see that photo on your wall, but when you show them the video, it's going to make the hair in people's arms stand up. It's going to make people um, bring them right into the moment. So the production quality that our production team puts into these programs, even though they're all just skydivers, quote unquote, um, documentary of skydivers, the full-time skydiving production staff, what they put into the video output, that by itself is worth um, everything to our project. And we, we don't spare any expense kind of like Jurassic Park, we spare no expense yeah. on making sure that everyone goes home with 
an extraordinary video representation of their entire uh, experience. So when they're showing the relatives at home, it's jaw dropping, it's hair standing up on the neck, it's, it's tingles, it's I, I want to be there, I want to experience that. Beautiful. Now I will make sure I add this video to the show notes. So yeah. uh, go to experiencesyoushouldhave.com, click on yeah. episodes. You'll find this episode there and you can watch the video. Uh, so if someone wanted to sign up for this, how far in advance do they need to sign up and where do they sign up? So um, they sign up with me. My email address is skydiveearth at gmail.com. They can also sign up direct with our parent company, uh, Explore Himalaya in Nepal. Most Westerners prefer to work with a Western um, point of contact simply because I'm in the same time zone. Uh -huh. uh, everyone, in, everyone in Nepal speaks English wonderfully, uh, so communication is not an issue. But uh, for better, for worse, myself and my actually my teammates as well, uh, Wendy Smith, who's in Australia, New Zealand, typically when someone in that part of the world wants to join our program, they will contact Wendy. Omar El Hejalan is uh, out of Dubai at the moment. Um, so when people in Dubai in that area uh, want to join us, they'll go through Omar. Ryan Jackson is our UK point of contact. And then Paul Henry DeBear, he's our documentarist. He's my um, teammate, business partner. He basically is responsible for Europe. And so Depending upon where the, the call comes in, I, I would or the email comes in, I would then feed it off to whichever part of the world uh, has the best point of contact for them. Great. And how far in advance does someone need to plan on going on this? So our preference is six months. Um, okay. That's ideally our preference. But that being said, once the drop zone is established and we know we're going to go, once and we've never missed a date, we've never missed a November. That's our, our primary target. We've gone May twice when people absolutely had to go in May. But November is our target. And once the drop zone has been confirmed as a go and we have commitments, we have deposits, if people decide last minute, two weeks out, they want to join us, which has happened, they're more than welcome to. There's very little pre-production that needs to occur once we've committed to make the trip. And I can get people coordinated inside of a couple of days to be able to uh, facilitate their trip in, give them an extraordinary experience in the Himalaya and then on the way back out again. Beautiful. Absolutely. All the time beautiful. for the holidays. Yes. Oh, this sounds incredible. Uh, like the ultimate bucket list thing that you should do is skydive Everest. I think so. Um, I've gone there 13 or 14 times in the last 10 years. And I can tell you with 100% sincerity that every time I go there it's like the first time i'm seeing it even though i know what i'm about to walk onto and what i'm about to experience but the power of that part of the world just being immersed in that environment it's like nothing else in the world and i've been very blessed to have traveled around the world and done a lot of cool things over the years but um i always say i've left a part of my soul in nepal up in the himalaya and it's like when i get back there now it's like I'm returning home after being away from that part of who I am for so part so long throughout the year. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now earlier you mentioned your email address and said something about Skydive Earth. Can you tell me a little bit about Skydive Earth? So thank you for asking. Skydive Earth is a new project that Paul Henry DeBear and myself, PH, he and I, um, it's a new company, a new project we, we're working on. It's extraordinary places around the world to experience skydiving. And some of these experiences are ours to offer direct, meaning they're, um, they're my visions, they're PH's visions. Others are visions that other people have had. You know, for example, last year we went to Egypt. We have some friends in Egypt that have gotten permission to skydive over the, the pyramids. So we went to the, uh, Cairo this last June or July, and we made tandem skydives over the Pyramid of Giza. And we have a team of instructors and videographers and tandem equipment that we send to these locations to take tandem customers on an extraordinary experience, not just go make the skydive, but have the experience with these people and, and being with the people is just as, as much a part of the program as the jump. And then we send them home with that extraordinary photo, that extraordinary video post-production in Ireland. We're doing an event, uh, tandem skydiving onto the lawn of castle Kilkenny. You know, it's a 2000 wow. year old castle right in the center of Ireland. We got permission to jump in there and then we're going to go skydive onto the Aran islands just North of Galway. And if anybody's wondering what are the Aran islands, 
look them up on Google and then think to yourself, wow, I could go skydiving there. You know, extraordinary experience. Um, Switzerland, tandem jumping and bungee jumping and rope swinging all within a four day period land with us. We drive together. We stay in the hotels at the same hotels and we basically live together for a week with our, our, our new friends and take them on extraordinary skydives around the world. We're doing a tandem jump over of active volcano in Chile, uh, the one that Roberta Mancino stood over. We're going to Antarctica in December, and we're doing tandem jumps in Antarctica in December. What? Um, the, the North Pole in April. Um, the world is our drop zone, hence the Skydive Earth um, designation of the company. There's extraordinary jumps all over the world. Um, we're working on a jump onto a remote beach into the um, Great Barrier Reef in April of next year, April or May of next year. Uh -huh. So the, on the only way out is by boat. So we're going to fly in, jump in, and boat our way back out again. And uh, essentially every continent has an extraordinary opportunity to do something fantastic on. And our goal is to make tandem jumps onto every continent, including Antarctica. And then while it's not a continent, adding the North Pole to the list so that people can um, see the world the way we do. And then Beautiful. just as importantly, go home with the, uh, the memory of it. Incredible. And last question, what are you most excited about with Skydive Earth? Like what, what's really getting you giddy or a future jump? So I was nervous with anticipation when I went to the North Pole. Um, that was a very, that was a recce mission. My, one of my teammates, Jim and I went up there to make a tandem jump. Had never been there before. Landed at the North Pole and we were in an MI-8 helicopter three hours after landing, going to find the North Pole because apparently the ice drifts. We wow. found the pole, we found the pole, jumped it, had an amazing jump and we're back two hours later. So five hours after landing on the North Pole, we had accomplished our mission and then spent two days on an ice base waiting for our flight out. This time going to Antarctica, the idea that I'm going to be able to set foot on the seventh continent, um, it's always been a unicorn of mine. It's always been a, a life dream. And the idea that tandem skydiving has effectively given me a passport around the world to share what we do with others, um, the jump itself is a skydive. It's going to be a cold skydive onto an ice pack or, of snow. I've done that numerous times. I'm excited about that, and it will be an extraordinary experience. However, it's the idea that I'm going to set foot on a part of the world that I never thought possible, and to be there with friends. Bill Booth's coming with me, his wife, Terry, uh, my cool. friend Jim, my teammate, and uh, PH, my videographer. The five of us are going down to Chile and then Antarctica from there. So the opportunity not just to do this, but to share it. And I think that I can close my side by saying, of all the things that I've accomplished in skydiving, whatever they may be, good or bad, <laughs> whatever it is, um, however you want to frame it. What I'm most proud of is that I wasn't the only one to do it. Every, every project I've ever set foot on, every goal, every company, every uh, event, I've immediately once signed on, thought to myself, how can I share this with my friends? And Egypt in February, coming up in 2019, I will not be there because I don't need to be there. Um, I'm sharing that opportunity with my instructor friends so that they can come home with their million dollar photo so that they can experience jumping over the, the pyramids and things like that. So I think cool. that's always been my driving motivation is to share my opportunities with as many people as possible. And I'm going to keep doing that as long as I'm allowed the opportunity to do the things that I do. That just sounds absolutely incredible. And uh, we did a podcast episode on a traveling to Antarctica. And it sounds like in the future, we'll have to do an episode on skydiving Antarctica. Yep. We'll see you there. I'll be, uh, we can make an appointment for January. I'll, I'm coming back right before Christmas so we can catch up in January and talk about skydiving Antarctica. That sounds amazing. Truly, Tom, thank you. You are an inspiration to me and for so oh. many people to just to keep on living and to really experience these beautiful places in the world in a way that we haven't even thought of before. Well, thank you for saying that. I would be remiss if I did not say that if Ted Strong, if it was not for him, none of this would be possible. Aww. Not my career, not, not my career with Bill Booth and UPT, not the world travels that I've been able to do. Ted was the one that challenged me uh, 12 years ago to leave the bank and follow my uh, passion in skydiving and live a life of purpose. And so I have a picture of him on my desk 
every day. I look at him and say, thank you for the inspiration to do what I do. And uh, I know he's somewhere in the, the eternity ether smiling down um, yeah. about all the parachutes and all the cool stuff that we're doing. So I'll never forget Ted Strong. I will never yeah. forget him. Lake Wales, many memories there. Yes, the polka dot parachute, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> among, among, amongst other things. But yeah, no, no one in my life has ever loved skydiving more than he did. And he gave me that um, contagious passion for it too. It's amazing. Wow. Well, so. truly, Tom, thank you. This has been amazing. And uh, and definitely check out the other episodes on experiences you should have. Absolutely. Uh, I just listened to your episode of, um, with Melanie, and it was fantastic. Oh, uh, thank you. So, yeah, so I'm we inspired. go from yes. – First time skydiving to skydiving Everest. So brought me right back to my first jump. Yep. Oh, I love <laughs> it. I absolutely love it. Thank you so much for listening to Experiences You Should Have. You can find the show notes for this episode on experiencesyoushouldhave.com. Click on episodes. We'll have all the information there on how to contact Tom and make this experience happen. Uh, It's really fun to find unique and amazing people in the world to interview. So if you are one of those people who have an experience to share please reach out. Uh, You go to experiencesyoushouldhave.com, click on contact, or find us on Instagram, uh, experiences podcast on Instagram, or you can use the hashtag E-Y-S-H and share the experience that you would like to share with the world. It needs to be able to be replicated and You need to be able to provide logistics such as costs, best time to do it, and a how-to guide to make it happen. So definitely reach out. Again, this is Gail with Experiences You Should Have, and thank you for listening.